Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the CTS Annual Transportation Research Conference. I'm Lori McGinnis, Director at CTS. I promised to start on time today because we have such a full program, especially this morning, many good things and, and exciting offerings. So wanted to get started on time today. Feel free to enjoy a little more breakfast if you want to get up during the, the morning session and take advantage of that. Well, I've been hanging around the transportation field for a pretty long time, and I love it so much because it's dynamic and complex and exciting. But never before have I seen the types of major disruption that are now emerging in transportation. The evolution of autonomous vehicles and that technology, the growth of mobility as a service, and the emergence of smart cities with connected infrastructure systems are examples of big changes that we are already getting a taste of. How will we maximize the positive impacts of these changes and minimize those undesirable impacts? How will we ensure the safety, equity, and performance of these systems? How will humans and the environment adapt to the systems? And what changes must come to our governance and funding structures to facilitate and support this rapid pace of change? Researching these types of questions is exactly what University of Minnesota faculty and researchers enjoy doing, and they gravitate towards these types of questions. And sharing the new knowledge that comes from this research is exactly what CTS likes to do. <clears throat> and we do it through events just like this. I want to thank all the staff and volunteers who helped plan the conference today. It looks like a fabulous program, and I know you'll all enjoy it. And on behalf of all those folks who put the work into today, we hope that you learn a lot and you enjoy the time that you have to spend with your colleagues. New to this year's conference, and in honor of our 30th anniversary, which we've been celebrating all throughout 2017, you'll see name tags with ribbons to help highlight and acknowledge engagement with CTS through the time spent by volunteers on our numerous committees and councils. So we wanted just to give a little special highlight and call out to the folks who give us their time and help advance the mission of CTS. Another new addition to this year's conference is the Career Conversation Roundtables. These roundtables give students a chance to connect with practitioners and learn about careers in transportation. So many thanks to the groups that are participating today, Kim Lee Horn, Met Council, Metro Transit, MnDOT, and SRF Consulting Group. They will each be hosting a conversation table today. And many thanks to our undergraduate and graduate students who are choosing to participate in that. Next, we are very honored to have Senator Klobuchar welcome us today through the magic of video. She was truly hoping she could be here in person, but ultimately her schedule didn't allow that. So, so please join me in enjoying what Senator Klobuchar has to share today. Hello to everyone at the University of Minnesota's Transportation Research Conference. I think you know I'd much rather be there with you in person, but there's just a few things going on right now, and I'm honored to join you via video. I'd like to thank Lori McGinnis and the Center for Transportation Studies, Charlie Zelli, my friend, who I know is going to be speaking later today, and everyone gathered together to discuss how to improve transportation in our state and around the country. The U of M has hosted this conference for 30 years. I've been honored to join you many times, but that is three decades of helping advance transportation research and making sure our state is a center for innovation in infrastructure. And I'm doing my best to continue to make this work a priority for the Congress. I have some big shoes to fill there with Jim Oberstar, but I know he shared my belief, and that is America is at its best when we're a country that thinks, that invents, that builds things, that exports to the world. It's what I call a co competitive agenda. It means making sure workers are being paid fairly and prepared for the jobs of today. It means supporting America's businesses and economy, strengthening our infrastructure, and bringing costs like college and health care down. It's that infrastructure focus that I want to talk about today. It has now been 10 years since the I-35W bridge collapsed. You know, it's just eight blocks from my house. It's a bridge I would drive over every day uh, with my husband and our daughter, and then it just vanished. 
Well, we rebuilt that bridge in Minnesota in 13 months. It was a model for advancing large projects, crisis projects, quickly and effectively. But it was also an example of why we must prioritize funding for infrastructure. We made a big step forward in 2015 when we passed the long-term bipartisan transportation bill. It was called the FAST Act, which by the way is always kind of scary to name any bill that in Congress, but we actually passed it very quickly. I was one of the first Democratic senators to sign on to the bill. Barbara Boxer was a leader on it and Mitch McConnell was a leader on it. Under the FAST Act, Minnesota will receive more than $4 billion in federal transportation funding over five years. It was the first time in more than a decade that we weren't just playing red light, green light with transportation funding. It was consistent. It wasn't everything that I wanted or that you wanted, but at least we had a consistent plan out there. But we also need to make sure we are moving forward on key projects and have that funding in place. This spring's bipartisan budget agreement included $10 million in capital investment grant funding for the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project, which is so important to our entire state and continues our path toward building more rail. I'll continue to push for federal funding to allow this important project to move forward as well as Botno and all those great uh, bus lines that we have going in the southern suburbs as well as the eastern suburbs. I'm fighting to make sure grant programs like the Tiger Grant Program receive strong funding. These funds help state and local governments make investments in critical infrastructure projects across the country. I've been working with Secretary Chow on a number of priority projects to strengthen safety, ease congestion, and improve mobility on roads and bridges. But there's still much more we can do. You know why? The American Society of Civil Engineers, I had them in for a meeting a few months ago, they don't issue these report cards every year, but they did this year. And the 2017 report card gave our nation's infrastructure an overall D plus grade. It's not just bridges and roads, bridges and roads. What's about the energy grid that hasn't been updated since the 50s? What about broadband? I think there's a real opportunity for lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to come together. The president claims he wants to make this a priority. Well, he may, needs to make good on it. I've worked with a bipartisan group, including Senators Warner and Blunt, to introduce legislation to create an infrastructure financing authority. It would create a simpler process for funding. Another idea I've supported is to tie infrastructure to comprehensive tax reform. There's some real problems with the bill right now, but if they would leave some of those problems behind and come to the table, we might be able to work something where we bring back the money from overseas and then uh, tie it to infrastructure funding here at home. It could provide hundreds of billions of dollars and a needed boost to the infrastructure needs we can, we have. Of course, I'm also fighting to make sure next year's budget encourages the investments we need. Unfortunately, the budget proposed by the administration would cut funding for many transportation programs that are really important in our state, like the Tiger Grant program that I mentioned before. The administration's proposed budget eliminates funding it entirely. Current the, currently, the program provides $500 million per year for transportation. The pros, proposed budget also cuts funding for the Federal Transit Administration's Capital Investment Grant Program, which supports light rail, commuter rail, streetcar, and bus rapid transit. In Minnesota, CIG funding will provide the federal share for the Southwest light rail and Botno. So you can imagine if we cut it, what it would mean. The administration's proposed plan would also reduce federal support to Amtrak for long distance train service. Long distance passenger rail is really important for our rural communities and we know how much we love the Empire Builder. Finally, the proposed budget cuts support for rural aviation by eliminating funding for EAS, which is so crucial to help small rural airports. These proposed cuts are bad for transportation and bad for our country. So that's a lot of bad news that we got in that proposed budget. But here's the good news. I'm working to protect vital funding. Despite what the administration wanted, the Senate Appropriations Committee negotiated and recently passed a bipartisan transportation funding bill that rejects most of these cuts and maintains support for key programs. And I'm fighting to make sure that that is a bill that get passed by the full Senate. And by the way, if it's any indication, the fact that we sort of 
went around them and did a budget this year that was really good, well, that should be a good sign. Our 21st century economy requires 21st century infrastructure, and I will work with anybody anywhere from any party to get this done. I know you will too. All of you are dedicated to making sure our transportation infrastructure is safer, more efficient, and ready to keep us on track. So thank you for all you're doing to move our country forward. I often say that, but in your case, it is literally true. Enjoy the rest of the conference. You deserve it. We're so fortunate to have the Senator's passion for and engagement with transportation and infrastructure. So she's a true advocate and we're just glad that she's engaged with us and with all of the state of Minnesota on this issue. A few housekeeping updates before we move to our keynote speaker. The co this conference awards up to six and a half professional development hours. And in addition, 13.75 AICP maintenance credits have been approved you can see a complete list of those approved credits in your packet. Guidebook, a mobile app, has been created for the conference where you can view the conference programs and abstracts. Engage in Twitter conversations, keep track of AICP credits and PDH, and more. Instructions for how to download the app are in your final program. If you have any questions or need assistance, don't ask me. <laughs> no, please stop. <laughs> there, no, there's no ask me button when it comes to technology. Uh, but you can stop at the registration dress, desk and they will take care of you. Please join the Twitter conversation using hashtag CTSRESCONF. And lastly, PowerPoint presentations from the concurrent sessions and plenary sessions will be posted on the CTS website, of course, pending the uh, author approval approximately one week from now. So let's get to the featured event. It's with true pleasure this morning that I get to introduce Zhong Li from Ashto. Zhong is the policy director uh, at the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, Ashto. So glad they shortened that to an acronym. It's a big mouthful to put out there. He leads the agency's policy efforts across all modes of transportation working with Congress, executive branch agencies, and transportation industry stakeholders, Lee represents the policy interests of state departments of transportation as bills and regulations are developed and implemented. In addition, he oversees AASHTO's centers of excellence and fee-for-service programs concerning environment, finance, planning, transit, and rail. He is founder of Young Professionals in Transportation, and I'm very intrigued about this, so perhaps we'll have a chance to chat a little bit later. This is a national networking organization for career development, and he has served as chair of the Road Gang, a DC-based highway policy society as well. He is a graduate of the University of Virginia and the University of Pennsylvania, and he's a hockey fan, which was a bit of excitement for him to come to Minnesota to really be where the home of hockey is. So. So that was a fun little fact to learn. So please welcome me, in, in, uh, or please join me in welcoming Zhong. Thank you so much, Lori, for the very kind introduction. And it really is my honor and pleasure to be able to uh, visit with you here in Minnesota and talk about what everybody's uh, been in their mind, right? Uh, tr how do we pay for transportation infrastructure? Um, before I get started, uh, just a quick word about what AASHTO is. It does have a very unwieldy acronym, but we're in transportation, so we're used to it, right? Uh, but it is now a 102-year-old organization representing all the state departments of transportation around the country, uh, including the 50 states plus D.C. and Puerto Rico, and obviously Minnesota DOT, as represented by Tim Henkel and Tracy Hatch, and I understand we'll see uh, Commissioner Zelli a little bit later on. Very active, a lot of leadership from Minnesota in these national conversations at the state level. And of course, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I am a regular and avid reader of the CTS Catalyst uh, newsletter. Uh, so it's really been a, a great resource for me to be able to keep track of all the great work that the Center for Transportation Studies has been doing. And it really is a national leader when it comes to academic research. Uh, and again, just uh, really excited to be here. So um, what I thought I would talk about this morning is in Talking about you know, how we pay for transportation infrastructure, just kind of set the basic context. Many of you are familiar with it, but maybe I guess a reminder of the kinds of 
kind of uh, the funding gap that we face, especially pertaining to the federal program, uh, and then talk about the buzz on the street uh, in D.C., but perhaps uh, beyond D.C. as well, uh, this idea of, of a massive infrastructure package that's been talked about for the past year. And then also talk about what are the states doing in the meantime while the federal solution is trying to be identified when it comes to uh, the revenue challenge. And then finally wrap up with making the value proposition for infrastructure. Why should the public care uh, about paying for infrastructure and what could they and what do they get out of uh, their contributions to uh, public infrastructure? So let me just start by showing you the kind of the scary uh, uh, highway trust fund chart here that shows the difference between the natural cash flows right now that the trust fund is having. The top line on the red shows the money coming. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The top line in red shows the money going out. Bottom line in blue shows the money coming in. As you can see, it doesn't match up. It hasn't matched up since 2008. Uh, and the last nine years or so, there has been a series of just these red light, green light things that the Senator Klobuchar mentioned, um, kind of hand-to-mouth existence of just trying to prop up this program by infusing it with general fund transfers on an ostensibly user fee financed highway, uh, or trust fund framework that's walled off from the rest of the uh, federal budget. So we've relied on now $140 billion of general funds uh, through a series of transfers, and that is not a sustainable path. As you can see, the gap is only expected to get bigger, so the structural deficit has to be addressed uh, sooner rather than later. On top of that, there is also uh, the uh, loss of purchasing power experienced by the gas tax. So gas tax is kind of the political boogeyman, uh, especially at the federal level, but it also happens to provide about 90% of revenues coming into the Federal Highway uh, Trust Fund. The rest of the, the money, about 10%, comes from various heavy uh, truck fees. But the gas and diesel fees uh, haven't been adjusted rate-wise. Uh, gas is still 18.4 cents per gallon at the federal level, 24.4 for diesel since 1993. And guess what? Like everything else in life, you know, when cost of living goes up, the gas tax hasn't able to uh, keep up with it. And maybe this is a little more relatable, you know, comparison to everything else in life. So you look at college tuition, guess what? It has gone up quite a bit. Same with health care. Uh, but even kind of the run-of-the-mill stuff, like I don't know, milk or bread, beef, uh, that's listed there. Yeah, again, costs of uh, things in life tend to go up, but the federal gas tax uh, has been fairly unique uh, in not being able to keep up with that uh, over the last 24 years. And we've actually hit a pretty special milestone now uh, where the federal gas tax, uh, since its inception almost, a gosh, uh, 100 years ago, uh, but really ramp up during the interstate program era in 1956. It's gone the longest now since being adjusted ever. So we've kind of hit the mark now about 8,700 days or so uh, since last adjustment. So, you know, this is starting to break with historical precedence of how, uh, you know, the rate gets adjusted to be able to meet the investment needs. And the paint, uh, the portrait that this paints is obviously not a good one. Uh, this is kind of our, I guess, classic, if you've seen uh, Ashto materials before, our quote-unquote cliff chart. It has varied over the years, as I mentioned. The $140 billion of general fund transfers in bits and pieces has caused various ups and downs or the height uh, differences in the cliff, but it is real. Uh, if there is no uh, some sort of revenue solution for the federal program, we're expected to see about a 40% decrease uh, in the federal aid highway program uh, by 2021, which is after the expiration of the five-year FAST Act. Uh, the spiral on the transit side is actually even more steep. Uh, what we're estimating is that federal transit uh, commitments, new commitments, will have to be wiped out for three years just to be able to pay back all the prior commitments that the federal government has made and then be able to rebound uh, at the quote-unquote sustainable level in the out years, which is drastically less than what the federal government is able to provide uh, right now. So what this chart shows is uh, not for actual reading. I know that, you know, when you do PowerPoints, you're not supposed to show a lot of small text and numbers. But the point is that this is just kind of the universe of technically feasible revenue options that are out there. We put this together, you know, we've you know, provided technical assistance to Congress about 
what are the different revenue yields? What if you adjust this rate on you know, the existing gas uh, and diesel fees, but also various freight-related charges? What about a more broad-based uh, 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 tax uh, what, based on income tax uh, carve-out? What about a vehicle miles travel fee? What about even like a, you know, a tire tax on bicycles to get their contribution into the federal program? This is just a really a conversation starter just to show that the universe is vast when it comes to finding technically feasible ways to pay for transportation investment. Another way to look at it, just various yield levels. The federal program, you know, we're talking pretty big dollars here, so you also have to be mindful of the uh, realistic yield that it has to be able to bring a substantial amount of dollars to be able to actually, you know, uh, power the federal program. Some of these fees just may not be able to get there unless you cobble together uh, a lot of them, which obviously it's hard enough to adjust existing rates uh, on, on existing revenues, politically speaking, but doing new levies is um, a, a even more uh, you know, significant challenge. We've even looked at this crazy looking bubble chart kind of that shows you know, what are the kind of the optimal policy you know, uh, proficient uh, re uh, revenue approaches looking at the implementation ease and administrative enforcement ease versus kind of the equity issue, the economic benefit of the different fees and things like that. And so we've looked at this so many different ways uh, at ESHTA, but what it comes back down to is there is no political appetite uh, to look at some sort of, again, a significant revenue uh, solution to provide that stable long-term funding uh, for the Federal Highway Trust Fund. So in the meantime, uh, again, what we're talking about a lot over the past year is the big infrastructure package. And maybe let's take a trip down the memory lane. How, how do we get to this trillion dollar number that people are talking about, right? So it all started two years ago with uh, the then uh, candidate Hillary Clinton talking about a $275 billion infrastructure package. That's where it started. That was the first kind of challenge, uh, I guess, when it comes to setting the bar. Then uh, about a year later, a little less than a year later, then-candidate Trump said, I'm going to double that. So it became a $550 billion number. And then a couple months later, there were a couple of uh, campaign folks for Trump, very significant campaign folks for Trump, uh, who talked about a trillion-dollar package. Uh, and one of them, uh, Wilbur Ross, is now the Commerce Secretary. And then Peter Navarro is now the National Trade Council uh, chair at the White House. And so, the, again, the bar uh, was raised to this uh, number that we keep hearing about now. Since then, uh, and since the election of, of President Trump, uh, what the administration has tried to hash out is, look, the trillion dollars, we still want to get there, but it will be powered by about $200 billion of direct federal funding support. Uh, that will help They'll be leveraged by introduction of private capital, introduction or further uh, encouragement of state and local revenues to be able to get to that trillion dollar number. But they've also been em emphasizing quite a bit on speeding up the project delivery uh, schedule, especially for bigger projects. Let's cut down you know, the 10 year length that they have identified for big projects, how long it gets to get through the environmental review process and permitting process, bring it down to uh, to uh, your time frame. They're also thinking like all infrastructure, right? Uh, I think those of us in transportation, obviously, we have certain interest uh, in a subsection uh, of infrastructure. But really, uh, the Trump infrastructure team is looking at every asset class uh, that is out there. But of course, each asset class does have different characteristics in terms of uh, the level of involvement by the federal government, by the public sector in general. Um, some, like at the bottom there of the list on oil exploration or power generation, tend to be entirely privately uh, financed and owned and operated, uh, unlike those at the top, like, the, well, the current air traffic control, that's a big debate um, how to handle that, but the roads and bridges and transit systems tend to be in the public sphere. So what the Trump administration uh, policy principles are laying out is, one, uh, make targeted federal investments, which means perhaps reduce the footprint of federal involvement in transportation investment. Two, encourage self-help. So this is the idea of raise more of your own money, state and local governments. Don't depend on the federal government so much 
uh, going forward. And um, uh, as our next keynote speaker later today will talk about from the LA experience, the kinds of local initiatives, uh, whether it's bonding measures, tax measures, uh, to be able to put more of their money on the table, that's what the White House is currently emphasizing. And then the last two bullet points uh, could be seen as, you know, not only uh, bring in more private capital uh, introduced to deliver projects, but also kind of getting into the P3 discussion about which entity between the public and private partner is better able to uh, handle various risks, especially when it comes to bigger projects. How can you optimize that risk so that a party that's just best able to handle that is the one that actually uh, is the one running with it in partnership between the public and private sector. I will say though that when you look at all of these four uh, bullet points as principles, what the Trump administration is essentially talking about is reducing the role of the federal government when it comes to transportation investment. Again, it's talking about less of the federal money or at least more of the local share uh, of the pie, the slice of the pie getting bigger. Uh, and also uh, getting more of the private sector dollars in, in lieu of, say, a large infusion of uh, federal dollars to support the infrastructure package. From the state DOT's perspective at AASHTO, what we have been emphasizing to both the administration and the Congress is that, look, first and foremost, the federal infrastructure program is really best represented under the Highway Trust Fund framework. And uh, it's a program that has worked well for the last hundred years in the form of the Federal Aid Highway Program, but also has added the mass transit component in the 80s. It has become increasingly more multimodal in its approach. Uh, it needs to be fixed. Um, the fix would cost about $140 billion uh, over the next 10 years in additional um, revenues on top of the monies that are expected to come into the trust fund. Uh, the political challenge there, as you can imagine, is that if I'm an elected official, you're asking me to pay $140 billion more, but what does that get me? Oh, it's just the same program at the current funding levels adjusting for inflation. So that is a, a politically tough sell, uh, no doubt about it. But another point that uh, we're making is that, again, referring to the earlier chart about the different asset classes, uh, transportation really does rely more on the public sector contributions than some of the other infrastructure assets. So whatever the final package is, put a large share of it into uh, transportation investment. Another point is that leveraging uh, the dollars through use of uh, financing tools and borrowing instruments, yes, many entities already do that. There are uh, great programs at the federal level like the TIFIA subsidized loan program that's already there. But there's only so much you can continue to focus on that. Uh, it has to, at some point, address the revenue problem, the underlying revenue challenge. Um, you can have the greatest, I don't know, copper wire making machine out there, but guess what? You need copper to do it. You need the actual resources in the form of dollars to be able to leverage that to bring about the investments that you're talking about. Another idea that uh, we're talking about is streamlining the project delivery process uh, by assigning more federal authorities uh, to the states that are interested in taking those on, especially when it comes to NEPA. There are already many states that are looking at the National Environmental Policy Act responsibilities on the environmental review side. What are the other ways where the states that are equipped to do so uh, can take on the traditional, kind of reduce the number of federal checkpoints, right? Going back and saying, hey, is this okay? Hey, is this okay? Um, that can definitely speed things up uh, when it comes to not just the big projects, but especially a lot of the small projects as well. Um, and also, uh, another point we're talking about is when we're, whatever the final package may look like, let's look at the most economically efficient uh, and wise investments in that we're not in the 2008 time frame anymore. It's not just about pumping a lot of money into the economy and try to unlock the credit markets. We actually, I think, do have the luxury of time to be able to really deliberate and strategize and look at what are the investments that bring the most robust multi-decade return as, as long-term investments like infrastructure always ought to do. Um, and then the last uh, uh, bullet point there is talking about relying on the existing program framework uh, the federal formula program, for example, for highway and transit uh, really conforms well to the federal government structure that we have in that there are broad federal guidelines and policy goals that it aims to achieve, but it's up to the state and locals to team up and actually select the projects uh, to work on. 
if you were to look at the infrastructure package money, again, whatever that money uh, the amount may be, if it gets into the business of the uh, federal government picking projects here and there and things like that, um, the track record just isn't very good as uh, has been experienced with the various earmarks, which we'll talk uh, maybe a little bit later uh, as part of the panel. So what are the states doing in the meantime? Um, so the states are already putting uh, the largest share into the overall transportation uh, bucket already. And, and that's certainly a challenge, I think, that we are communicating to the, the Trump administration that, look, the states are already putting in a lot of money in. How much more do you want us to uh, put in? And you look at the local share, that is the second largest share. State and locals are getting it done. It's the federal piece that has been the smallest traditionally um, because it is focused only on capital investments, not operations and maintenance. Uh, and what the states have done, uh, we've seen 31 states just over the last five years that have taken action on their own to look at some sort of a revenue increase uh, for their respective state level transportation programs. And we're also seeing more movement uh, on the fuel tax side as well uh, that being able to keep up with the purchasing power is uh, something that more states are looking into by not just indexing their fuel tax, um, there are other ways to do it, uh, tying into you know construction index, tying into, in George's case, actually the CAFE standards of all the vehicles registered in their state over the past year. Whatever that CAFE increase is, uh, is also then uh, put into the formula for adjustments. So other than the great outlier in Alaska, which hasn't adjusted their state fuel tax uh, since their inception, <laughs> Uh, everybody else uh, is starting to kind of uh, be able to, you know, uh, update their uh, uh, rates as necessary. And I would also say that states are very, very practical when it comes to identifying revenue sources. I mean, again, this list isn't meant to be, you know, read by you uh, from the distance, but just shows the diversity of approaches that are being taken uh, by the states that rely far beyond just the traditional, you know, uh, taxes on motor fuels. Uh, but looking at, you know, container fees, uh, land sales, uh, investment income, um, even casino revenues in some states are used, uh, some of it going to transportation. So with all that context uh, in mind, well, how do we continue uh, to move the needle when it comes to the transportation revenue and investment conversation? Um, I think the big challenge traditionally has been that People just have no idea uh, what they're paying uh, into the transportation system. And we've done a man on the uh, street type interviews in the past where we asked, hey, you know, how much do you think you pay in, uh, you know, state and federal gas tax? And people say, oh, it ranged from anywhere from, you know, a couple thousand dollars to this one gentleman saying, oh, six, seven thousand dollars a year. Well, the actual answer is a lot less than that. It's about a little less than $300 a year on average, uh, combining both the federal and state uh, gas tax. And if you put it in kind of the household expenditure terms on a monthly basis, we're talking about $46 uh, a month. And I would say that when you compare it to your utility bills, your cell phone bills, and especially the cable bill, it's a pretty darn good value to be able to access uh, the transportation system that they rely on every day. And what we've also seen, uh, what, and I would also just say that what we uh, need to do a better job, I think, as a transportation industry is not just telling them how much uh, things cost to be able to invest in our infrastructure, but what are the kinds of benefits that they derive from it. I think there is a huge disconnect uh, in transportation compared to the rest of the market economy that we all live in. I showed you that chart earlier about the price of the beef and like milk in the house. Typically, when you go somewhere, when you get a haircut, when you buy a gallon of milk, you know how much you pay for it, and then you know what you get. You get a gallon of milk, or you get a you know, haircut. But uh, in the transportation sphere, it is extremely opaque. People have no idea, as I mentioned, how much they pay. And conversely, they also have very little idea, I think, of what, what do they personally get out of it, you know? When they commute, uh, you know, 15 miles to their work and go over the roads and bridges that they drive on, do they realize, you know, oh, yeah, this bridge, yeah, it was about 50% state, 20% local. I bet there was some federal funding. No, of course not. 
Now, uh, to be fair, I mean, there are so many things in life where people, you know, may take it for granted uh, unless something goes wrong. That is actually not unique to only our industry. It's pretty much everything in life, aside from perhaps mass media, entertainment, and sports, that you only notice uh, things that, hey, what, what, what the heck is wrong with it? But when it works great, nobody notices, right? It's like being a ref uh, in a sports match, for example. So what are some of the common themes uh, that can kind of you know, push the message forward uh, based on the various state experiences uh, that have been realized uh, successfully over the years? One, again, goes back to that the challenges are clearly demonstrated uh, and relatable uh, to the public. The ASCE numbers, we rely on it a lot on the report card, right? It's now almost $3 trillion of needs, but again, make that relatable, you know, put it in something like the household, you know, uh, level impact of what's the contribution required at that level. And of course, again, the twin side, flip side of that same coin is making the uh, benefits of the investment crystal clear. These are the tangible benefits. This is why it will make your life easier. This is why it will make your life better. And then also going beyond the coalition of the usual uh, suspects when it comes to pushing the message. If it's embraced by people who don't have inherent interest in transportation, say like the transportation officials or the contracting industry, if there are others that say, hey, this really makes sense and I have no personal financial stake in this thing, that really carries a lot of credibility. Uh, and then the message of some sort of accountability and performance uh, and some sort of a reform uh, may seem a little cliched, but I think, you know, you just can't go to the uh, table and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to be doing the exact same thing again. Obviously, that's not going to work. And then I think a really crucial piece at the end there is, is there prioritization of the transportation agenda, especially by the governor? Um, because if you look at the state legislatures, every state legislature obviously has different committees. And guess what? Transportation committee, I bet they're in on it. They, there's no question there. But what about the governor? The governor is juggling 30 different issues at any one time, kind of like the national agenda for the infrastructure package, too. It doesn't usually rise up to, say, the top three that perhaps has the best chance to get enacted. But if it does make it to the top, because people beyond the self-interested groups are pushing for it, yeah, there's a much, much better chance of seeing um, results. I just close by looking at a couple of efforts uh, in the recent years at the state level, trying to make this a value proposition for investment. Uh, the Missouri uh, Citizen's Guide is actually a pretty neat tool. It's an interactive online calculator. I don't know how many people would be really excited to go to a state DOT website and you know, play with a calculator. That being said, um, you know, they really put it in that relatable term. So they say, look, right now, uh, the average driver in Missouri pays about 30 bucks in uh, state and federal gas taxes. So they have lower than average state uh, fuel tax of the other uh, parts of the country. If you pay 330 more a month, uh, that will go to our rehabilitation on road and bridges. If you pay 582 a month, uh, it would go to major interstate reconstruction. If you pay $1.55 more per month, it will go to provide options beyond the highways on the multimodal investments. And I like to kind of look at this as kind of the Starbucks, you know, example, right? So, you know, if you kind of go with a really basic cup of black coffee, uh, that, that, that will get you the multimodal options. If you go with like the really fancy Frappuccino 582, that will get you the major interstate reconstruction. That's not a huge sacrifice, uh, admittedly coming from you know, the state DOTs, to ask the citizens to be able to contribute for the kinds of investment benefits that they can uh, realize. And then another example uh, around the country is Oregon. Uh, state of Oregon has been the pioneer in the idea of a vehicle miles traveled fee as a potential long-term successor to the fuel tax. Uh, certainly Minnesota has been a great leader in that conversation as well, but they've gone, Oregon has gone the longest or the furthest in terms of having a permanently enacted legislative measure uh, when it comes to a BMT fee. Still limited to 5,000 drivers. They, considered between you know, converting their entire you know, uh, program affecting all drivers or a limited option. And the political will was there, and I understand, just to do the smaller version. But what they try to show is that, hey, 
this idea about you know the big trucks and the Priuses, like what does it really mean when it comes to the VMT uh, framework? And what their calculator shows is that okay, if the average driver is putting in about 13,000 miles, and if you have a big you know Ford pickup truck, uh, yeah, you are going to pay more. Uh, and but what happens in this scenario compared to the fuel tax is that there is actually a slight rebate on the big truck. Whereas on the Prius, there is a slight increase because they, the mileage efficiency is as such that it is way above and beyond your traditional vehicle um, in terms of uh, not putting as much money into the system, but still affecting the pavement and the roadways just the same. So this is the approach to try to explain you know, why the VMT approach uh, is what they see as the long-term uh, solution. So I think getting back to the value proposition uh, discussion, you know, it's all too easy, I think, especially for the state DOT, the MnDOT folks in the room, to, again, the ref example, right? People only get really upset at the refs if they mess up a call. Um, and those are the only ones uh, that I think we, uh, or typically get noticed uh, on the, by the newspapers, and this is just a sample of the headlines. But if you are able to demonstrate the credibility and the accountability uh, and be able to then lead to a successful revenue measure, um, there actually are headlines that uh, talk about the good things that the transportation agencies uh, can and do uh, around the country. So uh, with that, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak before you this morning and look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. I want to welcome our panelists and say how excited we are to have you all here to go a little deeper into this topic <laughs> this morning. And I would like to introduce you briefly. And then, as I mentioned, we have a set of, and I'm sorry that some of the folks here, feel free to move over if you'd like a better view. But uh, we have some prepared questions, so they've had a chance to think about what perspectives they'd like to share. But during this process, I'll be looking out to the audience, and please be thinking of your questions. So let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Tracy Hatch, Deputy Commissioner, Minnesota Department of Transportation. Tracy has been Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer at MnDOT since July of 2013 and Chief Financial Officer since, Mar since March of 2011. In addition to overall managerial leadership and direction for the department, she oversees the modal programs, strategic planning, financial management, and administrative functions of the department. Secondly, we have Jeff Heilstead, Vice President, Transportation Regional Business Line Leader of the Midwest Region for AECOM. Jeff has worked on many major transportation projects during his 28-year career. During the last 10 years with AECOM, he has focused on large transportation projects throughout the U.S. and leading transportation-focused business development in the Midwest. His project experience includes serving as program manager for multiple large interstate corridor reconstruction projects, that's a big deal, for both traditional state DOTs and, and tollways. So we're very excited to have a private sector perspective here today. Right next to me, Jim McDonough, Commissioner of Ramsey County. Jim served as chair of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners from 2014 to 2016. Prior to that, he served as chair of the Ramsey County Regional Rail Authority beginning in 2008, where he worked tirelessly to bring more efficient and accessible transit to the county. He is recognized as a national leader in the area of transit and continues to advocate on a local, state, and national level for support and revenue for projects within Ramsey <coughs> County. And on my far right, Professor Jerry Zhao, associate professor at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. A native of China, Zhuang Zhao is an associate professor of public administration in the Humphrey School. His research focuses on public budgeting and finance, in particular, how local governments generate sufficient revenue under ever-increasing constraints, as we've just been hearing about, how state and local fiscal structures affect the pattern and effectiveness of public service delivery, and how public and nonprofit organizations interact with each other in budgetary and service decision making. So you can see we're, we feel really fortunate that we've got an expert in, in these types of areas who's contributing greatly to the, the field right now. So 
pleasure to have all of you here today. So Tracy, I'm going to come to you first, okay? okay? Given the uncertainty around funding and some of the, the dire picture we were, we were just kind of seeing, especially at the federal level, how does MnDOT plan for and deliver a consistent transportation program? What are the challenges you face and how do you address those? Thanks, Lori. Um, I think there's a number of ways I could answer this question and so I'll start kind of general and certainly if there's questions we can, we can dive in a little bit more. But I would say in a nutshell, um, we have some really good financial policies around how we manage our funds and how we um, track our revenue and how we um, even have a little bit of reserve uh, revenue that's sitting in our fund balance on the Trunk Highway Fund. Um, I would also call out the cash balance. Um, now these are things that would help us to maintain over a short period of time. So it would depend on how deep the cut is. You know, uh, we were talking about the slides and how we look forward to someday seeing a different Ashto slide that didn't have the <laughs> cliff on it. So if the cliff really ever materialized, um, it would actually um, be a much bigger conversation. But if it was um, short term or a less steep cliff or if it was something where we had projects out, um, and we just needed to find a way to continue to pay for them, get them covered um, and, until we could revamp the program. That's a different, that's a little bit of a different conversation. And so we have mechanisms in place to help us manage, certainly in the short term. Um, but again, in the long term, if there really were a cliff that materialized, we would have a much different situation. We'd have to kind of go back to the, to the drawing board on, on the whole program. Um, so I would also say that we have some contingencies um, kind of built in, in addition to those financial mechanisms, we have just some contingencies for what we might do. Um, and we come up against this actually even every year um, when we talk about the federal, um, you know, federal shutdown comes up. And so we as a state agency in conjunction with the other state agencies do planning around that too. So um, it's, it's not a new conversation. We've certainly been engaged in it. We do have a lot of things in place um, that would help us certainly weather fairly seamlessly on a short-term basis, but on a long-term basis. Um, it's just, we're, we're planning for them to figure it out. We're planning for them to fix it. We're uh, modest in that planning, but we are, we are hopeful um, mm -hmm. that, it, that it will not be the cliff situation that we fear. <laughs> Any reactions or questions from the panelists for, for Tracy on that one? I, I was struck by one of Zhang's uh, points about they're really advocating for a, a longer, stronger look at these long-term projects, mm -hmm. not just the shovel-ready. Mm -hmm. And we know historically here, even our own legislature has been really about the mm -hmm. shovel-ready. Mm -hmm. So I found that encouraging, mm -hmm. but does that, how might that affect you? Does it change your planning in any way? Well, um, you know, it certainly takes a long time to plan, especially a really large project. So when we get into CR situations, uh, continuing resolutions where we don't have that predictable funding, we were talking about a potential new reauthorization that would be a two-year reauthorization. That's good. You know, six years is better. Ten years is even better. <laughs> so when we have a longer time span that we can consider how we um, get, get big projects in the queue, that's great. Um, there's always an interest to turn dirt really quick. Um, and we appreciate that, and we want to do the same. The challenge, however, really comes from a, a capacity standpoint. I talk often about this kind of production pipe, if you will. Like, there's just only so much capacity, particularly with existing staff. And often on the, um, you know, when we talk about construction, we talk about um, additional funding for transportation, we're thinking about um, construction. We're thinking about all those hard expenses, if you will. We talk about in MnDOT, we talk about hard construction. And um, typically that's money that's going out through contractors to, to get a job on the road. But there's so much else that t it takes to get these projects out the door. There's so much design work. There's planning. There's right-of-way purchasing. There's, there's just so much. There's things on the administrative side. And so, um, you know, that pipe, our ability to deliver is only so big there. And, of course, we rely on our consultant community to help with that. But um, that's where if, if they want dirt turned really quickly, we have to increase the size of that <laughs> pipe as well. Um, we can't turn dirt any quicker than we, than we basically are. I would say that at least at the state DOT, we are, we are, about, we are about really maxed out at, at what we can do in terms of turn dirt quickly. Okay. Uh, if I could that pipe. pile on there real quick. You know, the, the uncertainty in federal and state funding really mm -hmm. plays pretty strong into this because everybody wants 
immediate gratification, right? Everybody wants, that's why the term shovel ready really came there. And what it's forcing the DOTs to do is to go through planning processes and get, sh get, get, get projects on the shelf ready to go if and when money comes available. But you're actually seeing kind of the opposite now in some of these Midwest states who have actually tried to invest and get well ahead in the planning process where they've actually gotten, you know, yanked back by the, by the, F, the, the federal program saying, hey, mm -hmm. you know, you've got all these planning projects going on, but what you're planning to do far exceeds what your revenue source is going to be. So they're going to say you're going to need to either slow down or in some cases they canceled a bunch of planning projects mm -hmm. because they were, they were trying to be, to, to think outside the box and think plan ahead. And then the feds just come back and just yank it all back anyway. Mm -hmm. So true. And sometimes we sort of create our own monster, right? We, we, we want to get projects out the door, and, and we want to be responsible, and we want to be responsive. And when they give us cash, we want to get it out the door. And at the same time, then we sort of cr we create this expectation yeah. that we can always do that. Um, kind of to your point earlier about the, um, or actually uh, the senator's point about the um, 35W bridge. So often that gets held up as a hallmark for mm -hmm. what can be possible. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. what, what folks don't realize is, and I and I have heard a little bit in, you know, sort of <coughs> maybe the Trump administration can manage this to get this out of the way or not, but, but there's so much in terms of regulation. There's so much in terms of um, those processes, and you referred to kind of going back to the federal government um, time and time again to get, you know, new permits or reviews and so forth. And so... With the 35W bridge, like all that was kind of streamlined. Um, it was a, a huge national project. Um, and so all those things take time and money. Mm -hmm. so. I wanted to add one more thing on the pipeline that Tracy talked yeah. about. Because on the planning side, working with consultants and being ready. But, and in, 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 Tracy alluded to it, but on the other side, for contractors to invest in the equipment, for contractors mm -hmm. in the community to invest in workforce development, to have a workforce prepared mm -hmm. to make these get complete these projects, they need to understand where that money's gonna come from, not just one or two years out, but three, four, five, six, seven years out. What's coming in the pipeline? What is the capacity? Can I invest in three more bulldozers? Should I be training another hundred operators to make sure that we're prepared to address and, and be able to complete the projects as we move forward? And that gets really tough because then even when we do get an opportunity, where is the capacity in the private sector to be able to respond? Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Yep. It's and true. I think on this topic, I'll just add that what we are seeing is kind of the classic lag of the federal regulatory uh, mm -hmm. structure. So um, decades ago, I guess, at this point, uh, there used to be uh, in the, the planning and programming documents uh, way too big of a pipeline mm -hmm. of projects that are being proposed compared to the realistic revenue streams that can actually turn them mm -hmm. into uh, reality. And okay. so this idea of fiscal constraint came about, right? Mm -hmm. So you can only at the federal, as part of the federal program, uh, use available and committed dollars that you realistically expect to uh, program your state transportation improvement program. Well, now we're in an environment because of all the cliff situations that we keep facing, like Minnesota mm -hmm. DOT, a lot of other states also have really pared back on that <laughs> pipeline of the stuff that can be made ready to go. And at the same time, we're increasingly seeing more of the private participation through P3 deals. We're looking at the TIGER and now the infra grant type discretionary grant programs where there's no guarantee you're going to get that mm -hmm. money compared to the formula program, yet the fiscal constraint requirement uh, requires you to have that available and committed. And you can't have you know, your in, uh, infra or TIGER grants committed mm -hmm. until you get it. So it's caused this bit of a uh, you know unintended bottleneck on the regulatory environment again that was designed for 20 years ago. I also think that the the cliff situation at the federal level brings just so many other resources to bear on that. It brings 50 states together. It brings ASHTO. It brings all of our partners together. The consultant community. We can all kind of band together to share that you know, sad situation, <laughs> um, which is a lot different than the situation we have when it's just a state or a local, you know, bond referendum, you know, where we're having that cohesive story, that cohesive message, you, you mentioned stories, um, that is a lot harder. And, and sometimes we get even looked at as, you know, sort of partisan, <laughs> when the reality is, for the most part, the DOT is really not. Um, you know, we certainly have, uh, you know, we work for the governor and, and 
but when it comes to tr infrastructure, like, I mean, there's just, everybody's driving on it. <laughs> you know, everybody's riding the transit, everybody, you know, so it's, it's really, it's, uh, um, the beauty of it is it's a big problem at the national level, but we've got a lot of people kind of pulling in the same direction. It's, it's a lot harder when you're talking about getting um, local money or state money through, even though we, we, we did get some this year, but, yeah. Okay. All right, excellent, thank you so much. So one of the administration's messages, as we heard from Zheng, is encouraging self-help. And certainly at the local level, you know, that's been happening. And, and Commissioner, you've been an advocate, really, and, and a champion to make sure local, local governments in, in our area are giving their share. So what do you see now as the role moving forward? And does, uh, what does your role become now with this encouragement at the federal level? Right. And if I could look back. A little bit to kind of help maybe define the local role um, looking for I'll go back to the 2008 transportation bill that we were mm -hmm. able to pass that mm -hmm. the Association of Minnesota County spent two years with our county engineers and our local elected county commissioners to come to an agreement about what we could move forward as urban suburban and rural counties in the state and be united in that we had 87 county boards in this state pass resolutions in support of that to help advance that 2008. We did some major changes. There was some changes to how the CASA formula was split moving forward that we came to an agreement at the local level um, to be able to help advance that. I think another um, key piece here that we work on every day as county commissioners and mayors and city councils, we get elected by the same folks that elect legislators, right, in our communities. So we not only do we have influence, but we can help provide cover to help be able to make get uh, legislators to be able to take some of these votes that we need are important to us. And so we work on that all the time to ensure that our relationship with our legislators at the local level, again, whether it's Kitson County or Ramsey or Hennepin County, that they really understand the impact and that we're standing with them as they're moving forward on whatever is being advanced at the state. Another example here, I'll, looking backwards, we take a look at the central corridor of the Green Line up and running right now. That got built under... Jesse Ventura and Ted Mondale, Governor Plenty and Peter Bell, Governor Dayton and Sue Hag. Three very distinct governors, three very distinct Met Council chairs. And to be able to have that consistency and leadership and advocacy, to be able to take a complex project like that and keep it moving forward, and to be able to move forward with an actual investment that is having tremendous payouts right now, that happens because you have local leaders that are willing to step up and commit eight, nine, ten years to these complex projects to be able to move them forward. Um, Lori, as you talk about, you know, the partnership, you know, part of the OA bill gave counties the ability to impose a local quarter cent option sales tax in the metro. Seven counties could do that, form a joint powers board to help fund transit. Five of those counties did that. We did a quarter cent. Um, to be able to help bring some stability to local funding so that we can make sure. The hardest part always on the federal, uh, on the funding for the, especially the big transit projects was 50% federal usually or close to it. But then really, how does you come up with that non-federal share? And we had been depending on the state for that. And that became the toughest piece was to get that state funding. So to take that control locally, but then make sure that we're helping pay. Um, part of the OA bill allowed the counties that weren't a part of a joint powers agreement to actually impose up to a half cent. And so we just adjusted here this year um, because of the limiting factor on the quarter cent for the joint powers to fund transit. You know, we disbanded. There were some other issues going on there and changes in thoughts on some of the county boards. But Hennepin and Ramsey County this year, we raised and imposed another quarter cent. So we're imposing the two largest counties in this state a half cent local option sales tax to fund the non-federal share of the capital of these lines, but we're also paying for 50% of the operation of these lines as we move these forward. So you've got the two largest counties that really do have a big uh, benefit from these investments, but these are the two economic, the counties that are the economic engine for this state. These are major investments, Central Corridor, the Blue Line. These investments not only affect the two counties and the two cities where they're at, but they really help this state and that economic engine continue to move forward. I challenge anybody to take a ride down University Avenue or down Hiawatha Avenue along the Blue Line and see what's happening with those investments. And we hear 
you know, from our business partners and uh, even folks out state. And, you know, the biggest issue that, especially at the legislature, they try to do this urban-rural divide. And I would argue at the local level, we don't have that. We are united as we possibly can. I know why it's important for outstate to have 10-ton roads, and I fight for 10-ton roads for those folks because they need it to keep their communities healthy. They understand why we need the investments in the metro to make sure that we're viable, that businesses not only <clears throat> expand in our community, but we actually attract and retrain. You know, one of the biggest issues facing the outstate folks and kind of this issue is they're losing their young folks, right? Well, you know what we want, we're at, if they're going to lose their folks, we'd rather see them lose them to the Twin Cities <laughs> than Denver, Portland, right. mm -hmm. Phoenix, you name it, right? <laughs> so we got to make sure that we're all working together on this. And to your, you know, to the earlier piece here, where does the local electeds fit into that? I think we bring st stability, we bring long-term vision and leadership to that, and we bring kind of that um, bridge building and connection from all the various stakeholders that have a very specific issue mm -hmm. to help try to bring everybody and move everybody forward together. Excellent. I, I hadn't thought of those things, so you've just educated me in a great way, and I will mm -hmm. find ways to carry that message. <laughs> but, and and just, just as a final reference, next Tuesday I'm making my 10th trip this year to D.C. Okay. with coalitions and partners to not only you know, help educate our delegation, but to work with FTA, work with the Highway Administration for them to really understand mm -hmm. the decisions they're making out in D.C. right now, the impact that they'll have at the local mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any thoughts or, or questions to build on Jim's comments? All right, well, I think, Jerry, great segue to you and your research. So you've, you know, you've spent time looking at how, how funding is uh, happening across the st state and how transportation is being funded, looking at these various levels. Mm -hmm. So could you share a little bit about that research? You know, what got you motivated about that? What are you finding? How does it relate to things that Zheng shared with us earlier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I study transportation finance uh, coming from uh, my early background in urban planning and then some training in public budget and finance. And I always uh, like to look at the issue uh, from a capital structure perspective. Anytime we're talking about uh, the arrangement of multiple sources of revenue to support something, we need to look at the joint effort of federal, state, and local, and we need to look at the balance between funding and financing. And mm -hmm. in funding will be tax and fees, and in financing could be borrowing or, or, or p 3 And in, in this case, uh, uh, certainly, a lot of people uh, have uh, attention on uh, whether the federal government has raised fuel tax or not, or whether what are the, the decision making out there. But actually, they, there's a whole lot that's indeed happening at state level and local level. And there are a lot of effort that has been put on. There are a lot of innovations out there that are new things that are, that are tried and could be further studied. And in terms of, well, one, one thing that I have noticed is that. Uh, as John mentioned that the whole system is so complicated. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard for, well, not only, I would say, political leaders, well, not only the, the public, but the political leaders to understand how we actually piece that money together. And it's, uh, it, it would be a big uh, research need to, to help bridge that gap. Uh, one example is uh, in the, at the Humphrey School, and recently we have been working on a database uh, Minnesota Transportation uh, Finance Database, and not that uh, it, it's not that in this country the information uh, related to transportation money from federal, state, or local are not available. It's they're all there; they're all open information, but but they're not easily accessible because they are all scattered or fragmented. But through the project, well, it, it would great help from JC <laughs> and other uh, uh, agencies in the state. We were able to piece them together from many sources, and we allocate them. We aggregate up uh, up some of the data, and we deaggregate uh, some of the data, and we were able for the first time ever to uh, finish some research about how uh, the whole system, not only highway, local road, but transit, how the money broken down by federal, state, and local, and how the money come from different counties and how they are spent at different counties. 
and to what uh, to the extent whether some counties contribute more than they receive or they receive more, and those are tremendously helpful, and those uh, would help uh, decision making at a state level and also at a local level. To what extent they 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 want to think about their own efforts or how about the high level of money that will be redistributed. So, Tracy, you've participated in, in this work, and when I'm with you in the meetings, I see you nodding. <laughs> I, I sense that you have a positive reception to this, and are you seeing ways to use this information? And do you have thoughts or guidance on how do we advance that work? Yeah, I find it really interesting. I think it's really interesting work. I've not been personally involved. I know staff at the department have been uh, <gasps> with the database work and kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, I, I, you know, to your point earlier, Jim, about the um, the rural urban sort of conversation that is a very alive and well at the legislature and mm -hmm. so I think that that information is really important and in particular the the context of that information is really important um, I also find it to be really interesting when you look at the transit investment when you take the transit investment out when you look at the um, the county share the the expenditures versus the revenue share um, there's really a lot of interesting data there the thing I love about it is the data um, not coming from the department. I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier the kind of accusation of partisanship, and we, particularly in the finance realm, um, we, we, we provide just the honest truth mm -hmm. um, to the legislature and other policymakers. And yet, you know, because we're an executive branch agency, sometimes that, um, you know, is, is hard to sell. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Jerry and his team being very well respected and coming from the university, it's, um, it's helpful to have data that, that doesn't... Um, come from what could be thought of as a partisan source. So, um, so yeah, it's, it, I find it to be really encouraging. Mm -hmm. Is there more work needed to populate the database, or what, what would you consider the status of it? Uh, about that project, or about the whole, well, the way I see it is there are so many things that we should do more. Well, one is to help uh, the public uh, have a better understanding of how we get the money, how we spend the money. And the other side is how we help everyone seeing the value, mm -hmm. the impacts mm -hmm. of transportation. Mm -hmm. and, and also, uh, in recent years, we have done some projects uh, uh, working on this direction, uh, try to assess the impact of transportation, either at a really local level, sometimes parcel level, sometimes county level, sometimes even regional level. And it's not only the research part, but also how can we make those research findings more accessible to the public, mm -hmm. make it a, a, a better way of uh, some better communication tool. Mm -hmm. And CTS have helped tremendously, mm -hmm. tre tremendously in, in, in this. All right. Well, we, you know, I think we hope to move this, that forward and certainly input from this panel here in shaping the messages and the, you know, how that looks I think would be really helpful. So don't be surprised if we call on you guys <laughs> to help shape some of that work. So Jeff, I'd like to come to you next. And public-private partnerships have been on people's minds mm -hmm. and you know, been in the discussion now for several years. You know, what are you seeing? Do you feel like we've, we've made a breakthrough? Is there more, where is more work need to be done? Are they really going to be an important part of, how, of our transportation future? What are you thinking about that? Well, I mean, clearly uh, the rhetoric out of the administration is private investment in infrastructure projects. So, um, you know, that, that, that kind of use that as kind of the baseline. Uh, but, you know, there's always been a lot of criticism on P3s, and, but there's also a lot of benefits, right? So, you know, as, as you go down to uh, some sort of alternative delivery, design, build, P3 type process, you know, one of the obvious benefits to it is uh, potentially a shorter uh, implementation from time that you give notice to proceed to actual opening up of the, but but really the tangible benefit is um, that there you can achieve some very significant cost savings uh, through the process. Uh, we did a study where we took uh, 25 uh, uh, larger design build P3 type projects from around the U.S. both transit and and highways, and we found that on average you could get about a 20 percent savings over what the regular engineering estimate was at the beginning of the project. So clearly having the designers and the contractors uh, working together, whether you're talking in a P3 or CMGC or something like that, getting, getting everybody's head in the game there, because contractors, 
they know certain things, engineers know certain things, so you can achieve some significant uh, um, cost savings. Now, the detractor side of that is, well, then there's just one contractor working on it, and you know, what's everybody else gonna do? One engineering firm, uh, where does the DBE goals fit into that? Thing, fit into that? But that's really not the case. Uh, a good example is uh, the North Tarrant uh, Expressway in Dallas. Uh, they had over uh, 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 150 <coughs> different DBE and minority contractor and engineers working on it. They had uh, uh, you know, multiple engineering firms, multiple contractors on the project. So there is a way to structure the design build P3 in order to do that. Now, the beauty part of the P3 is that you're, legis you're, 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 you've, you're, you're making the contractor or the entity have skin in the game. So it's to their best interest to try and bring the project in as cheaply and effectively as possible. So they're gonna be looking at at how to do things. Uh, one project in particular uh, that was implemented uh, by the contractor and engineer working together, they were able to, to, to decrease the, the bridge decks by like 19%. That's huge, that's real, that's real tangible money. And uh, having them having skin in the game and having an investment into it uh, can go a long way. Now, the other detractor uh, to P3s is, well, you know, they're just going to build it the cheapest way they possibly can because as soon as the project's done, they leave. And then the, then the owner of the facility then has to take up annual maintenance and, and operations of it. Well, in a P3 scenario, you can build in uh, uh, a maintenance and operations, or at least a maintenance component into it for 20 or 30 years where the contracting entity is responsible for all of the regular maintenance and, and, and fixing of defects uh, for the next 30 years. And, and you can build in there where the original entity can't sell an asset off for a period of time, so they still have the skin in the game. So there's ways to work around it, but clearly if we want to be in lockstep with the administration, we're gonna to have to start thinking about some sort of P3s. And then if you take a more broader look at P3s, there are partnerships that the DOTs uh, can enter into in order to achieve uh, your ultimate goal of a, of a first class, world class facility. And I'll, and I'll pick on highways a little bit right here. In 2025, it's estimated that 10% of all the vehicles on the road, particularly in the urban areas, are gonna be electric vehicles, 10%. So forget about what that does to gas tax and all that other stuff. But there's a real need in there, right? So how can you partner with the local utility agency to get in-line vehicle charging on certain segments of the road? It's not like you have to do 33 miles. I mean, you can do half mile segments and they can get some real benefit out of it and then charge them for that. That's technology that exists today. So how do you go about doing that? How do you, how do you implement a smart corridor using, I'll pick 5G, um, and all the benefits that that can have? How do you implement smart truck parking? Uh, Ashto's got a, a, a pilot project going on uh, in which you know advanced notification or even a reservation system for these long-haul truckers so they have a place that they know that they can show up to and overnight. So there's a lot of different ways that you can go about it. It's not just privately financed roads, privately financed transit. Uh, it's more thinking out of the box and maybe getting some partnerships with other ones. Mm -hmm. Last final thought is, is funding. Uh, Jong mentioned the Tiffy alone, single-handedly one of the best programs that is out there. It is cheap money. Tolling agencies, when they bond out, even if you have a really good credit rating, mm -hmm. they're selling bonds at four and a half, five percent. Well, Tiffy is around two and a half, mm -hmm. right? And a lot, of, and it's not that much of an onerous process because they have to be eligible for the federal funds, so there's a bigger NEPA process and stuff like that. But you know, even convincing some of these other agencies that typically don't look at something like that, oh, well, we got all the money we can, or I can borrow cheaper than you can. I don't know if you really can. 
Because the TIFI loan is a heck of a deal, and I think it's over 30 years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it can add another component to it. So, uh, we clearly have to think out of the box, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so. I love the idea, the, the breadth of P3s that you spoke yeah. to, because yeah. so often, and Jung and I were talking about this earlier, so often we think of P3s as like the big P3s, mm -hmm. you know, the really complicated projects, availability payments, brand new infrastructure, all of that. And, and there's a place for that, um, but there's a, also, I think, a lot of room for right. other types of P3s, right. um, whether it's um, design build, CMGC, even like the work we did on the Bren Road project where we, um, you know, took in some private uh, equity for that. And, and, and those things don't necessarily count as debt. So my concern sometimes <coughs> with P3s is, um, and, and this gets really complicated, but, but essentially most of the P3s, those big P3s at least here in Minnesota, would get booked as debt. Mm -hmm. And one of our um, policies that I mentioned earlier um, is, is that our debt policy I think is right on. Um, it's 20% is the max that we would um, be leveraged against uh, state resources. And so, um, but because of the uncertainty at the federal level, I really feel strongly that we need to keep a certain bandwidth um, you know, debt is a really good and important mm -hmm. piece in the toolkit, but there are some states that are so leveraged that they're in deep trouble, <laughs> um, especially with any even short-term uh, vibration in the, in the federal space. Um, so our, our maintaining our, our debt in the right place is a really important thing for me. And, um, and so P3s that, that mm -hmm. come short of that are really mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Jerry. Oh, <coughs> yeah, P3, uh, P3 is such an exciting topic. Uh, for the past several years, I've been studying uh, this topic uh, in the U.S. and also happening in China and also in some other countries. Mm -hmm. I'd like to offer uh, some uh, recent thoughts uh, with some competitive uh, perspective. I think first we should think about P3 that are used for different purposes. P3 can be used first as a managerial tool mm -hmm. or they can use it as financing tool. Uh, financing tool. As a managerial tool, it, it could be really, really good, and, and Jeff mentioned the benefits of uh, like reducing the uncertainty in uh, construction budget and uh, scheduling. Uh, this is actually one thing that U.S. B3 has done very well, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's actually the unique piece of P3 in U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another regard is, well, but if we get to the financing part, that's the part that we should be more cautious. Uh, and, and in this case, we can also say that U.S. has been quite cautious compared to U.K. and some other countries. And states have been cautious in the right way because in this country, state and local governments have been able to borrow money mm -hmm. for capital projects at a really low cost. Like, uh, thanks to the municipal bond system here, mm -hmm. uh, the average borrowing cost may be like 30% or 4%. And any time we use P3 or other mechanisms for financing, financing, the, the way I think about it is simply where it's rearrangement of financial resources over time. It's a little bit like scooping up money, <laughs> right? And it, 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 it's good for money, good for projects that you need to spend a lot at this moment, but you don't need that much in the future. Mm -hmm. And you can scoop it up and pay it back <laughs> bit by bit. But thinking about the whole country and the, mm -hmm. the huge transportation system out there, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost ongoing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any individual project, especially some bigger projects, that make good sense. But if we are thinking at, about the whole system, and that actually speaks more for the funding, that's mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. fundamentally reliable. And anytime you use P3, uh, private sectors need needs payback, and those pay payback would come either as a governmental availability payments or maybe as, as direct user fees, mm -hmm. most likely uh, the rate of return will be much higher than mm -hmm. the typical municipal bond rates. In this country, maybe 7% or even mm -hmm. higher. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'd like to connect this topic to uh, some recent, I would say, PBP movements mm -hmm. in China. It's like, just got back from China one day ago. Oh, wow. And it's a little crazy. <laughs> well, <you> wait. <laughs> <laughs> in China, well, just the numbers kept me awake. <laughs> in China, <laughs> since two years ago, they have, the government is pushing forward 13,000 PPP cases. Uh, two, more than 2,000 cases has been signed. And the whole target is to, well, leverage $2.4 trillion, wow. but I'm actually really, really concerned. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the government has been suddenly so hot on this topic, although in China, PPP has going like this up and downs for the past four decades, 
the the reason that the government has suddenly become so hot in this issue is local government borrowing has become main alarming, oh. and the government is trying to use that as a substitute. Oh. But it could be good or for bad. On the good side is that I would think that well, several years ago, uh, ago local governments in China tend to borrow from national bank, and the system is less transparent. So sometimes there are a lot of I would say uh, the tendency of over investment. It's, it's quite unlike in US, but, mm -hmm. but right now, when you work with a private sector, the good side is that private sector may be an additional check. If they feel that the project has no value, they may not even put in money. Mm -hmm. But another side, the downside is it could be another kind of borrowing that's even yeah. hidden. Yeah. Because it's not even in the title mm -hmm. of borrowing. Mm -hmm. right. And so it could be really good, but it could, it could also be dangerous. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerry. Commissioner, did you have? Yeah, a couple of comments. Um, so at the national level, the National Association of Counties, we've been very supportive of the proposals to, because we, you know, we haven't built the infrastructure and support to really develop um, good, high-performing P3s in this country, and we need to do that. That's a great tool. But I always, I, we, we always do with a word of caution, right? Um, you know, especially, you know, investments in, say, our rural communities or in our, urban core where the P3s might not be attractive to the private market. And then we're going to have this inequity investment and we need to be paying attention to that because those are some of the areas that may need the most investment to help us all be able to move forward and to be able to pay attention to that. You know, you still have to have a revenue source, right? You still have to have a revenue source. And for anybody to think these are a substitute for a bill that actually contains revenue. And I think that's the danger of, you know, adding to the toolbox is going to be really important in making sure we use contractor at risk on Union Depot design build with our contractor. And it was amazing. We we cut a year off the project timeline. We they were at the table solving every problem with us. You know, your point on DVD, they more than doubled the, the goals on meeting the DVD requirements. And so I mean, the more we can use those as tools in the toolbox, so your list even gets smaller, the font gets smaller, right? There's more tools to use. But in the end, if, if that detracts and, and we think we're solving the problem because we've incorporated or strengthened the toolbox with those, mm -hmm. without a revenue source, none of these tools are going to be of any value right. to us. Right. Absolutely. Right. And I'll just add that I think what Jerry was talking about, the two different angles of P3s, the financial angle and the management angle, I think it may be more productive to focus more on that management angle side because, yes, uh, you know, it's, if you're not going to rely on the municipal bond market to finance your project in a way that borrows money, brings in mm -hmm. private equity, sure, you can do different things, perhaps you can do more things. Mm -hmm. But the real benefit, I think, does lie in the ability to transfer slash optimize the relative mm -hmm. risk between the public and private sector. I love the example of the Port of Miami Tunnel. Absolutely. Uh, because, as you can imagine, Florida is a pretty flat place. They don't really build tunnels. <laughs> so that's a perfect example of why don't we bring in one of those big tunnel boring machines and an expert in that to be able to take on all that risk that the state is you know, uh, shielded from. That's a great example, I think, of a P3. But you know, when we hear so much right now in DC uh, about the idea as part of the Trump administration platform of asset recycling is kind of the buzzword. Right now, the idea is if you already have a revenue producing publicly owned asset, why not you know, uh, do a P3 concession on that? Uh, realize upfront payments and then put that money into non-revenue generating publicly owned infrastructure assets. You can do new projects. You can perhaps rehabilitate existing assets. And there you go. You get your big. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. chunk of money to be able to put towards that. But I think that gets the message wrong in that you're focusing only on the financing side, mm -hmm. right? right? Because you're not able to realize revenue uh, increases or adjustments, you're looking at kind of the, you know, the loopholes. Per, uh, for example, with the asset recycling example, you are going to be foregoing whatever the asset that you're doing the 30-year concession on, right? A future mm -hmm. revenue stream. And you're just bringing it all up front to be able to mm -hmm. pump into other projects. But Okay, so you got your investment plan fixed for now. What happens 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now? And if it's the P3 done right, uh, it can bring, again, the management benefits from that concession as well. But I think we just have to be very wary to not be lured by, 
oh, we can get all this, uh, you know, big yeah. payday up front. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you know, uh, everything else be damned. And when you set up your, when you set up your P3 alternative delivery, however you want to call it, it's really important to know what the goal is. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if the goal is to achieve the improvement at the at the lowest cost you would set it up one way where the owner may not have as much control but if it's and if it's to do schedule enhancement that would be different and then mm -hmm. if it's for financing mm -hmm. you would do it different so how you set up a p3 and how you set up the procurement documents mm -hmm. can really impact what the ultimate goal is and you want to make sure that those are aligned and to your example, which was one of the that I had on my list, <laughs> Port of Miami Tunnel, it was originally estimated at 1.2 billion. They brought it in at 650 million. Wow. That's a 46% savings. Yeah. Clearly one of the bigger mm -hmm. options of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at a very large scale, obviously. But it just goes to show you that, you know, you can have some real tan we're talking real money. Mm -hmm. so almost a half a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Jeff, AECOM, large, large global company. Do you, does your company have a goal to be in this space? And what's, what's the goal? Uh, we are. Mm -hmm. We do. Mm -hmm. And we are. <laughs> uh, how's that sound? Yeah, yeah. we... Uh, uh, just, just wanted to open the door the, yeah, for there, I, mean, there's a, there's a, I mean, yeah, we're, we're, we're fairly large, 97,000 employees or something like that. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that we do quite a we were involved in the Port of Miami Tunnel. Uh, we are involved in some of these other ones, and we actually have a financing arm that actually, so that we have a seat at the table as well, called AECOM Capital. And you know, if 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 you if you look at our <coughs> mantra, it's that we want to, you know, be a the uh, uh, fully integrated delivery service. So okay. it's it's really uh, from the planning process, permitting, operation, maintenance uh, for it. As a matter of fact, that the acronym AECOM is architectural. <laughs> engineering, construction, uh, operation, and maintenance, mm -hmm. which was, I mean, that was, you know, 25 years ago, so mm -hmm. I don't know how they thought about that, but wow. I, I think I got that right. Please don't tell anybody if I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, so, so it, that is something that's, that, that we try to do. We find mm -hmm. resistance with it because they really sometimes don't want the engineering community in, in the mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. The contractors and the, and the right. ferrovials and dragados of the world, they mm -hmm. just, you know, you just throw money at right. it. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to do is not commoditize the engineering. Mm -hmm. um, a, lot of a lot of the dangers with P3s is, is the engineer now becomes just like, you know, getting the lowest sewer contractor, right? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do it for? Okay, well, this firm's going to do it for this. Can you match it? If not, I'm going to go and, and drop you, mm -hmm. which is really commoditizing the industry, and it's really forcing maybe not the best innovation and ideas onto it. So that's a, that's always a detractor on that, uh, but we've but I think as an industry as a whole we've been able to kind of push back on that. I think there was a four or five years ago there was a real drive just to keep the engineering costs absolutely as low as you possible because they they thought of it as a commodity. But now I think they're starting to see that you know having the experienced engineers in there and and you know going back to the point where. You know, it's if in a P3, it's really just like the big engineering firms. Well, that's that's really not true. You always want to drive it down to the local level, because they've got the in-depth knowledge. They know how to get things done. So you're always going to engage multiple engineering firms, multiple contractors, when you're delivering a big project. All right. Thanks for that. I'm ready to turn here. We've got more questions, but I also want to be aware of the time. So, all right, we've got a question here. In the middle, Margaret. Okay, a um, couple things that I haven't heard a lot about so far. Um, first of all, it seems like looking around the country, um, states that have been successful, um, a lot of times there's been a big high profile project or two. And that does seem to be another factor, um, along with having a big coalition, um, that makes a big difference. And we've seen it at times in Minnesota that you have to be able to, if you're going to show the public, show lawmakers, the value of more transportation funding is to show specific projects on the transit side. It's been really clear, um, whether it's a central corridor, 
I'm sure you're going to be talking about Southwest and Botno when you go out to DC as opposed to we need more money for transit. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, sometimes there's a tension between the agencies that want to and need to spend money on maintenance and preservation and don't like earmarks and the political side where you need to show here's what you're going to get. Um, how, how you see that um, as being important in this whole discussion and moving the political angle forward. But also um, ballot initiatives um, are something that we see more in other states. And I'm wondering what you think kind of the trend is and if that's another option that more states are looking at to kind of bypass lawmakers and just go directly to the public to try and get some movement in this area. So if I could start with the first part of your question. Um, it's a great question, and I think there, there's always this tension, and I don't mean like fighting kind of tension. I just mean like kind of carrying two truths in your hand at the same time um, around the idea of having a big project or having a specific project that you can point to and say, we will build this if you bring the money. Uh, and we did in this last several years, actually, with Commissioner Zelle and the governor really making a push, along with uh, many other folks, but for a uh, huge transportation investment in Minnesota. And so we did have an, you know, a list of projects that we would do. We also have our 10-year plan. We have MNCHIP that demonstrates that we simply don't have enough um, revenue to, for example, in, invest in um, uh, metro mobility even in the, in the future years. And so there, there's a lot of things that we can point to um, and I would say that sometimes the challenge is that some of those things aren't sexy. <laughs> They're just not sexy enough than if you were to say, we're going to, you know, 18 lane it from here to, you know, the Wisconsin border. I mean, it's just not as sexy as that. Um, but the reality is that um, it really does take revenue, sizable revenue, to do even those projects that are currently in the plan. It takes sizable revenue increase to make sure that we have enough going into local <coughs> investment um, what we call our SIPs, um, you know, there's there's more needs there than what we can manage into our ass our current assets. How do we maintain and operate those current assets? So even on the infrastructure piece, let alone you know metro mobility, um, in terms of how we um, provide um, you know additional mobility in the metropolitan area. But but on the operating side, which I you know I'm just going to come back to for a second, we forget how expensive that is as well. And you know coming up here, let's hope it's it's let's hope it's several weeks in the future, but there will be a day where we will all be struggling to get to work and to get to the doctor's office and to get to where we need to go. Um, and it takes significant resources to make that possible. I remember a few years ago in February, we had a huge snowstorm. It cost us $20 million, that one snowstorm. It was over three days, but, but those are real dollars and it's not sexy. <laughs> but we don't want the Atlanta approach either, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we don't want people stuck on the freeway for days because it snowed. Mm -hmm. um, so we get out there and we handle it and we, and we clear it. But all those things take money. And if we're always um, pointing to that one big project, it takes the spotlight off of all those other things we need to do. And we, you know, we're not fans of, of earmarks, obviously, and I know that, that others are, but we really um, push back on the idea of earmarks because um, we think that the data, the infrastructure, the asset management, the performance metrics, all those things ought to drive where that investment goes rather than, um, you know, a political choice. So uh, we, we know that the politics are, are part of it, and we embrace that, and, and uh, it is part of the great system that we have, but... Um, to the extent that we can help let performance, let asset management, let the risk factors um, that exist on our system kind of drive where that investment goes. We, we think that's the best approach. So, Jim? So I think ha having that list, and I think Charlie mm -hmm. Zelle, Commissioner Zelle has done a great job. I, you know, mm -hmm. To your point on transit, when mm -hmm. end up in the Ramsey went to half set, the public knew mm -hmm. Southwest, Spot, and Orange Line, Riverview, Gold Line, and Rush Line. You know, to the point where the business community, everybody, I, we, we didn't have, we had one person really that mm -hmm. opposed that when we did that because everybody know, knows what they're getting. But we can't underestimate the power of politics, right? <laughs> Sarah Klobuchar mentioned the 35 bridge. How many people here remember after that bridge collapsed, Governor Plenty for maybe three days actually said he would support a gas tax? How many people remember that? It took like three days for them to walk him back from that, right? In 2008, we had six Republicans vote to override their governor 
go against their caucus to support this bill. Five of those lost future elections. I would argue none of them lost because of a gas tax increase or the option, local option for local sales tax option. It happened because they were being punished for going against their caucus for overriding their government. Governor, so all the work we do about data, what what the need is out there, I think we've done a really good job. What the, those investments would buy if we have more revenue, it's really about the coalition of folks that are really going to come together to demand accountability and take the politics and push it aside a little bit. I don't remember 22 or 20, 30 states have raised the gas tax. Almost a majority of those are Republican legislators and Republican governors signing those. And it's occurring in those states. And for some reason, we cannot get a pass that partisan politics in this state about infrastructure investment and I think at the federal level too. Jerry? Uh, I can take on the second uh, half of the question a little bit about uh, local uh, ballots. Uh, those uh, special revenues that are levied uh, for transportation through the approval of public referendum, typically. And it's quite true that in Minnesota, we do not, uh, we have not used uh, those as uh, to the extent that some other states like California or many southern states have. Uh, some background of that is that uh, we need to put this into the overall like state and local uh, budget structure and in our state we, we always have the tradition that the states levy more money and have more uh, public services that are centralized uh, so we have relatively less uh, revenue uh, flexibility at a local level or relatively a small percentage of local uh, fiscal burden and so this is always the well debate between more centralized way or more decentralized way giving more local autonomy the way Minnesota has been uh, doing for a while, maybe better on the equity side, but right now I really, uh, uh, actually I'm a big supporter of giving, it, it's now it's the time to allow a lot more, at least some more local discretion in those activities, especially linking to local transportation, which would have direct local economic impacts. Yeah. Local people are who can directly see those impacts mm -hmm. and uh, having the state to authorize local governments more revenue options, that's a good thing. And local governments could still use their own discretion to decide whether they want to use it. And even if they are thinking about it, they will put it in a ballot and the public will still have a time to choose. Yeah, I'll just add that maybe just the idea of the project list seems to most appropriately be you know, lined up with the local uh, jurisdictional level just doesn't really work well at the federal level because it's just too far removed. I would say that at the state level, the experience is actually a little bit more mixed in that if you do the project list approach, you're promising a lot of things to a lot of people all throughout the state. Some states have taken the approach of, how about we just give your region this chunk of the money and then you guys hash it out. Um, same thing with you know the referendum, I think, model is that if you're talking about specific projects at the local level, people can relate to it. They tend to pass higher margins, but at the state level, I think our experience, again, is a little bit mixed, uh, where it may actually be easier to go through the legislature to do something like a gas tax increase than to just put out a vote, right, out there for referendum, gas tax increase, yes or no. That's going to be very risky. Yeah. We have another question. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand some of the... Uh, some of the pros and cons of VMT, I, I know that in 2009, Sukar, 2009, okay, just after. Yeah, could you hold it closer, hold oh. the microphone closer, so please? So I'm trying to understand the pros and cons of VMT as, as an alternative way of funding or you know, future looking ways. I, I know in Oregon, there's some statements made that it's ready to go of, of sorts. Um, there were some other public studies. There was a study done over here in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, Geez, I haven't heard anything about it lately, but you know, if you do the math, it's, it's about, about four or five million vehicles in Minnesota, $250 million in maintenance, so I don't know, 50 cents per month a mile, uh, per vehicle. So I'm trying to understand what activities are there. Is it really completely not practical? Is there really no support for VMT? Uh, can you yes. do something on the registration? So I don't know, I'm just asking. Okay. There, there has certainly been, yeah. I think, a lot of progress since I remember I see Max doing it over there with the cell phone triangulation <laughs> model, like 
uh, nine, eight, nine years ago, right? There, there was a, a lot of the conversations at the time when Oregon was doing their, at, at that point, of just a pilot program. They had advanced to, again, this 5,000 permanent legislation model. I'm sure they are looking at ideas to expand beyond the initial 5,000. Mm -hmm. California has a pilot program with 10,000 vehicles. Washington State Transportation Commission is setting up their own. So the West Coast, mm -hmm. I think, is starting to really get covered uh, with the idea, in, including interoperability, there is also a multi-state coalition amongst a lot of the Western states looking into the issue. And at the even at the federal level, even at the federal level, there's a $95 million pilot money uh, that was uh, part of the FAST Act to look at surface transportation funding alternatives, which a lot of that is looking at the VMT when you're looking at alternatives. So mm -hmm. now we are, I guess, uh, at the round two of the $95 million given out in tranches. There were eight states that got the initial money last year, and then there are uh, soliciting for uh, uh, the new tranche of money to build on existing efforts. And it doesn't have to be kind of the all-out GPS-based, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the privacy concern raising type approach. I mean, for example, Missouri got some of their money to help update their vehicle registration system to be able to move away from, apparently they have a horsepower-based registration system, <laughs> and try to tie it to more realistic kind of, you know, uh, road usage and the appropriate charge for that. We did here in Minnesota, along with some partner agencies, did receive um, some of that funding from those, uh, yeah. And we're doing a, uh, which we don't have time to talk about, but, but Minnesota is partnering in that uh, space, and we're trying to move forward with um, kind of this uh, sharing economy concept. And so we're doing some, some real innovative stuff mm -hmm. there. I would say that I think that what I understand um, is really that the technology isn't really the barrier. <clears throat> Um, there are, you know, nuts and bolts that need to be worked out, but technology I don't really think is the barrier. And I think the same is true for the most part when we talk about automated and connected vehicles, that the technology being there is not going to be the challenge. It's all of the policy implications and it's all of those other pieces that get really complicated really quickly. Um, but I was thinking one day about the, um, you know, the, we talk about privacy concerns, and you're exactly right, Jung, that that is probably the driver in the distance-based user-free concept. Um, the, or at least the stall out in some cases of the distance based user me concept. But, but when you think about how our privacy, how we make trade off decisions about that all the time, uh, for example, prior to smartphones, there wasn't quite, you know, big data did not exist the way it exists today prior to smartphones. And so we were willing and are willing to trade off um, significant privacy elements to carry a smartphone. Mm -hmm. When you go to the grocery store and you stand and you're looking at the, you know, the Wheaties, um, they know exactly where you are, how long you stood looking at that particular item, how long you, you, know, you moved to the left or the right and you compared other products, how long you were in this segment of the store, that segment of the store. They know where you drove, how you drove, how you got there. And, and, we, and, and, we're, and we're willing to, to um, accept that. And so mm -hmm. I think that, that technology, as it advances, and particularly as we start rolling out connected and automated vehicles, that ITS infrastructure, I just think that that will open up such an opportunity for us to revolutionize that space, much like smartphones revolutionized our, the way we look at privacy when it comes to, you know, big data. So I, I, I think there's, we're a little skittish about it maybe in the public, you know, arena right now, but, um, but I think that there's huge opportunity coming if we're ready for it. I actually would like to uh, echo a little bit on the sharing economy side. I see actually amazing opportunity opening up for BMT-based uh, charging. Uh, and uh, our colleagues, we, we have a fun project going on right now. And actually, the traditional uh, concerns about VMT fee are two. One is privacy. The other is mm -hmm. it costs money to install those whatever <laughs> gadgets into a vehicle. But think about car sharing and ride sharing. Think about Uber, Lyft. They already have they already everything. Have. They already have the facility where the, the, the gadget to collect all that information. And people seem fine, right? with all the browse information that's auto automatically built in. And so think about maybe in five years, mobility as a service, this part of service itself would get into, I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. 30 or even 40% mm -hmm. of all <coughs> the vehicle motorization, and actually we are getting there. Mm -hmm. if, if we use this sector as a, a, the, the first cut to, to right. try those ideas. And that's exactly the crux of our, uh, the, the project that we're working on for this. Let's ask a question to the audience. How many of you have smartphones right now? Raise mm -hmm. your hands. 
How many don't have our smartphones, right? If my husband were here, he'd... Right, exactly. So, I mean, the technology's there, right? I mean, it's all, we, are, we are already carrying around the ability to do it. And if you don't want it to track you, well, there's other things that you can do. Uh, so, you know, with the, with the vehicles now with Wi-Fi, enabled Wi-Fi, I mean, you could have the car through the Wi-Fi at midnight every day report how many, you know, what the mileage is that day. And then you get charged based on that. So there's a lot of different ways about going about doing it. And, you know, and, and, you know the, the big thing is, is, you know, right now we're making decisions for roadways that may open up in, you know, eight, nine years. The technology is going to be different. The needs are going to be different. And how you go about addressing that and funding that has got to be different. Well, nice wrap up there. I hate to cut this off. It's just, I mean, we're, we're just really continuing to roll here. One of the questions we didn't get to is about messaging. So this value proposition, how do we communicate to the public in, in a, with a message they're going to understand? So all of these panelists had a chance to think about that. Are you able to hang around a little bit for, we have a break coming here. So if you want to engage any of them and learn their thoughts about messaging around this topic, I'll encourage you to, to talk with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But let's thank the panel. <laughs> really informative. I learned things, and that's always a, a great day for me. So we're ready to have our break. Please move uh, into the reception area. You'll be called to the, the concurrent sessions within the next uh, 15 to 30 minutes there. And please join us back for lunch. We have another great presentation.